trillions of dollars are at stake in this week's OPEC. So it's time to discuss options and suppression once again. We'll also be talking about four of the main reasons we believe markets could be on tenterhooks and what happens after the S&P 500 has remained so compressed. Everyone's discussing the debt ceiling, so is it worth us revisiting 2011 to take a look at some of the scenarios that could play out? Today, we cover all of that along with Bill Ackman's new buy. I don't think you'll be surprised when you take a look at the stock he is getting into. Well, welcome back, everyone, to The Daily Show, where we talk about markets around the world. We'll start off here with the news, then we'll lead into the macro, the lead indicators, the central bank liquidity, and then, of course, the hottest charts coming your way. If it's your first time here, welcome to the community. Subscribe, smash that like button. I'm sure you're going to find a lot of value in today's video. We'll start here with the lead stories. Bill Ackman's at it again. He's purchased 10.3 million units of Alphabet. And I think he's always purchasing it for one reason. And that is that he believes there is an AI advantage moving forward. And also Alphabet is relatively cheap in comparison to some of the other big tech stocks. Amazon's another one that obviously comes to mind straight away in terms of valuations compared to something like a Microsoft, Nvidia, or even Apple right now. And speaking of milestones and valuations, take a look at this. Apple is now worth more than the entire Russell 2000. Now that's some low breadth. Basically, Apple is a absolute behemoth in the markets and it's accounting for somewhere between 14 to 15 percent along with microsoft of the total s p 500 market capitalization you know it's getting bigger and during these types of low breadth situations we've tended to see markets actually drop in the subsequent months so it's a time to be definitely cautious in the markets we'll talk about that later but we're still very dull and we're grinding higher at least on the queues so we haven't seen a turn just yet on that one let's talk about credit card debt basically we're not seeing any decline in what usually would be a bad quarter the first quarter usually sees a decline in credit card debt as people pay it off 20 years we've never seen this before and I think it shows us that really people are spending just like they were in 2020, just like they were in 2021. But the unfortunate thing is they're paying now 20.3% kind of like on average here or record highs for these credit card debts. And if they're not paying them down and it stays around this $1 trillion and starts to rise again, that's going to put a lot of pressure on medium income earners and, of course, the middle class. Let's jump over to some charts. And I want to go back in a history lesson of 2011. We'll revisit this in the next video we do. So stick around for that. That will be tomorrow after the close. But I want to talk about 2011. Now, we obviously saw a pretty large kind of rise in 2011 coming off. You know, more of an October base kind of seems familiar, yeah? And then we saw some February sell-offs, some March grab-ups, and then we saw some May sell-offs followed by one last hit before the debt ceiling thing really blew over. Now, we don't know whether the debt ceiling is going to become a massive problem again, but if you're betting on it, like I guess the stock market technically is based on the CDs because we know that the credit default swap is super expensive right now compared to what it was. I'll show you a chart later on then there's some cause for concern. We've got Yellen going out to CEOs and talking to them about problems that might be coming up and warning them of issues. We've got CDs out of control. And of course, we have an impasse at this stage. Now, if this comes to be true again and the markets kind of freak out, what was actually one of the beneficiaries during this time may surprise you. Let me do an overlay here. And this is why we need to go back in history and have a look at some of these times and take a look at treasuries. You might notice something occurs where treasuries remain suppressed for a period of time and then actually rally through the debt ceiling issues, even though that's counter to what most people think. Remind you of any time that we're seeing right now, treasuries coming down, obviously yields at the moment becoming sticky and going up. There are reasons for it, but imagine if we had a similar occurrence. And this wasn't just for a little while. Look how far treasuries ended up going before they got weak. We actually saw a huge run that almost lasted a year and a half of treasuries doing very, very well. An interesting time indeed for markets, and we'll come back to this one later. I also want to talk about complacency in the market. This is put call writing and or put writing, and basically it's been one of the best years on record for put writing. Effectively, this means that the markets have, of course, remained trapped and we haven't really seen that huge sell-off. Now, that's no surprise to anyone. The only sell-off we had was during March 
or February into March. And then, of course, we've rallied since then, thanks to central bank liquidity intervention, which we'll talk about in a second. But yeah, put call rights, a lot of complacency here. Usually you do see periods of time where it goes okay for a while. And then there's sort of like epic sell-offs that come out of nowhere that you don't expect them. Not so much black swan events, but definitely epic sell-offs. Here's the Qs, which is, of course, the NASDAQ versus central bank liquidity. Now, this is a very important chart. We're getting into the deep red. This means it is time for us to be extremely cautious on markets because the discrepancy or the divergence is very large. And I think you've got to be careful here. I've, I've told you I'd update you on this chart. It tends to be a pretty good indicator of turns coming. I still think we're going to drive higher on the queues, and we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, we are starting to get into the territory now of previous highs. And somewhere in these zones up here is where I think you've got to be ultra cautious. So we'll talk about that. Also, the way that the queues are grinding up, it looks like there's going to be different stocks. We're seeing Amazon. We're seeing Google obviously getting that rotation and a few others. And we talked about Amazon in the last video. We'll discuss it again later on today. Let's look at the skew, small compression. So we're looking for the skew to get absolutely mauled, similar to what happened in August, similar to what happened in April. Both incredibly good times to be a bear in the markets. We want to see mauling of the skew and effectively the black swan event so suddenly disappearing that being a bit of complacency on the side of the put kind of buyers. And all of a sudden, we hopefully should see a bit of a sell-off if that's what you're looking for. But as this skew keeps driving higher, it's very unlikely the markets will be able to crash, fall, do anything like that. It just remains in a stable kind of environment, which is dull and moving up. We also discussed on the weekend video this concept, which is the Dow Jones transportation average versus the Dow Jones itself. Both of them had basically five days down in a row and even five days in a row for the Dow is very rare. We'll show you the Dow in a second. So when we see these types of stats, we only could find it during two periods, 2011 and 2020. Now, because we could only find in those two periods, actually what happened is in 2020, it drove about 9.5% higher before getting destroyed. This was in February of 2020. In 2011, we drew, drove up about 2.6% before getting destroyed. So very interesting times. If that comes, it's just a coincidence maybe, but certainly an interesting stat. Here's the US 30. Again, we had those series of days down. We now technically should expect a further upside potential if it is to run the same way as it was in 2020 and 2011. But it only happened two times in like 13 years. Let's move over here to the move versus the VIX. This is the bond expected volatility versus the VIX. 94th percentile. Rare. <laughs> Very rare. The bonds market, the VIX market do not agree with each other. We already know why. It's because there are so many VIX calls. VIX calls are everywhere. Basically, everybody in the street is being forced to hedge risk. And that risk is being you know, forced in due to the debt ceiling, due to some other problems. And, and effectively, it's suppressing the VIX. Also, zero DTEs are suppressing the VIX. I've said it here before, maybe VIX 1D, which is the new CBOE code, could be best to put on your charts if you're interested in actually seeing VIX volatility play out. Because at the moment, very suppressed. We saw a small spike up in the VIX, but really it's still quite down. Here's corporate bonds. Now I'm looking at corporate bonds, inflation adjusted, because I'm interested to see whether this continues to go down. You can see where we are right on that low. I'll update everybody here on the channel with corporate bonds, but effectively if this market keeps going down, it's making a switch of trend while the stock market is kind of still driving higher on the queues and staying range bound on the spy. It is not a good sign traditionally when the bonds market's going off in one direction and the stock market's like, everything's all good, it's all green. Again, does it play out the next day? Generally not. It takes often a few months, but this is something that we are looking at. We're paying attention to it. There are some positives in the market as well, of course, both ways. One of the positives is that so many retail traders have been trying to short the market in here. You can see on this small spec index position I shared over on Twitter, take a look at that. That is extremely, extremely short from the retail side. Of course, markets find it hard to go down there. The positive sign for bears would be that the put call robo ratio is actually starting to decrease again. Now, we've seen similar times when it's decreased like this. 
that we've hit those peaks. So again, we're looking for this to continue to come down and basically more calls to go into the market. I also saw, I said that I'd share with you guys a few other reasons why I think the market's doing what it's doing. One of the other reasons was, of course, the hedged VIX. The hedged VIX is just so many calls. And look at these calls rising here while puts are remaining relatively stable. That's a problem. Again, it's suppression. A lot of these will come off on Wednesday this week. And as we head into Friday, we know that we're also going to lose a huge amount of puts on the S&P 500 that sit around 400 on the strike. So that's going to be an important one because third week options expiration, there's so much money at stake, trillions of dollars that we need to be aware of it. The last chart I want to show you is credit default swaps. If you're not familiar with what that is, well, maybe ask ChatGPT, but it is very important here that we understand that credit default swaps on the five year, on the one year, all of these United States debt is higher than it was during the 2011 crisis. And this is not our opinion. It is the opinion of market, well, people with like billions of dollars and trillions of dollars. They're increasing these CDS. So effectively, it's getting close to the GFC like levels. And that's strange. I will say that's strange along with Yellen coming out. That is a very weird thing going on. So as we said in the start of this video, we've got an S&P 500 range that has dropped well below average. Are there any stats that we can get from this kind of point? Well, we don't have too many reads, which I think is a bit of a problem, but here are some of the stats. If you're a bull, technically the next 12 months looks very good. And I think the bear case scenario here is probably going to be slotted somewhere. I'm kind of thinking about this, slotted somewhere between July and October of this year. If we're going to see a big problem with the markets, I feel like this is where the problem's going to be. Could be wrong, but that's, I think, where it's going to be. And the reason I would go with that is it's Q3 we go into. It's similar to other periods in time that have happened. And also there are some synergies that would occur over that period. But if bad things are going to happen, it's probably going to be in the Q3. Notice the stats over the one year are still very bullish. Notice the stats over a two week after this read only 33% positive. That's interesting. Usually uh, you don't get such low statistics on a lot of these things. So something to keep in mind if we do see a turn, it might be something where the markets kind of grind low, break down, come to a level, pick back up and then end up like here. And then of course, we'll see what happens from there. But an interesting stat nonetheless. Let's have a look at S&P 500 swings on a daily basis. You can see it's well down from where it was. We were averaging around 2%. It's kind of like a fun market, isn't it? Now we're getting back down into one. And people have asked me, is this unusual? Well, this chart probably tells you not really. There are periods of time where markets are historically incredibly boring. And there are definitely periods where you'll be looking at markets just slowly grinding higher, doing this and just doing that. Now that's called a normalized market. I don't think we're in a normalized market yet, but yeah, it does happen. What about the Fed watching tool? Well, we know that the next expected rate hike is only 20% expected now. 20% though is more than it was. So one day ago it was 15, one week ago it was 15, one month ago it was 16. So it's actually gone up. So there is some expectation now that because of some of the statements from the FOMC members that we could be seeing another rate hike out of the US. What do you think in the comments down below? I've polled people on this and most people say no. Obviously, only 20% of economists believe it at this stage, but we've seen these charts switch a lot. Interesting that there is a, on the cards a potential new rate hike. And I would say for any Australian viewers out there, there's a high chance that we get another rate hike for the, from the RBA here in Australia, as they're well behind New Zealand, the Fed, even Canada, for the viewers out there, there's a good chance that unfortunately your central bank is also quite behind, um, even Europe, we're all behind uh, in especially Australia and Canada. Let's move over to smart money versus dumb money. Zero news from this one. Um, there's absolutely no edge here on this chart. Bring it up though, some of you have requested it, so I thought I'd bring it through. This will be an interesting one this week. We obviously don't see the signs of a market that can sell just yet very heavily unless the survey comes out pretty much on the super positive side after this week. So sentiment votes, 29.4% of people are bullish. Neutrality is pretty much the same and bearishness is down, which is good if you're a bear. 
but it is not low enough. Usually you want to see around that 35 to 30% on the bear and you really want to see the green one go above 30%. Once that occurs, if you see reasons that are technical to go with the short plus the other th reasons, let's say skew compression, for example, ooh, that would be... That would be tasty if you were a bear. At the moment, though, bulls still in control of this market. There's not much you can do about it. Recessions are painful. Now, of course, the rules have changed because we already technically saw a recession last year. They changed the wording. So this may not be the stat we can use. But S&P 500 generally saw drawdowns of over 20% in seven of the last eight recessions. And in almost all of the recessions since 1929, most of the max drawdown, 67%, took place during the actual recession, not in the 12 months prior. Now, you could say this stat is, is already happened because of what, what we're talking about recession, but what if we have a double recession? What if we have a recession that was never called a recession, then we have now a new recession? Could we be seeing the stat play out again? Something to keep in the back of your mind. It is just a stat, but I think it is very important. Dot plot, we're looking towards this. Again, the FOMC member discussion I really encourage people to go and have a look over the next 24 hours while we see these speakers come out. Most discussions I've seen come out of the FOMC members has been, we are not looking at rate cutting anytime soon. So this dot plot, when we get the new dot plot, should show very similar things to what we've seen before. It's very important that happens if you are a bear in the markets. If you are a bull, you want to see the, the basically the Fed cave pretty fast cut rates and at the moment the market is pricing in now pretty much one guaranteed cut by the end of 2023 it was pricing in between two and three cuts so yeah it's starting to move up in line with what we're thinking about but there's been no reaction from the actual risk on stocks let's talk about ford p again if you're an investor i know there's a lot of viewers here that are swing traders investors and short-term traders investors i always say ford p is a good indicator of great deals and it is not a great deal in the markets right now it's not horrible it's not as bad as it was for a long period of time but it's certainly not cheap so i like to get under that 16.8 ideally in the 15s and we're just not seeing it we have seen it though back in of course october last year and we brought up a similar chart at that time and i just always stress that investors timing's everything and being patient is the hardest thing. Remember, the biggest word in trading is temperament. Buffett, Munger, Druckenmiller, any of these guys, the best of the best, the ones that have gone through decades and decades of great performance, they've always had the same real thing, which is temperament. They always go with that. Our kind of thoughts came true in some ways over the last 24 hours. We discussed KRE. We thought it would bounce from that zone, and it did. So KRE saw a nice bounce. That's regional banks. It's probably a little bit oversold. A lot of people are super negative on it. I understand why, but remember it has sold. It has created some kind of thing, like let's say structure, trapped people in, sold again, trapped people into shorts, rallied, gone down about 75% of that, and now it's rallying off that base. Doesn't mean it's going to the moon or anything, but I think back to the highs, we'll discuss that later, is very possible no other insights on rotation there. And as we move over to the last five days, interesting that we've seen gold now the underperformer, obviously metals also underperforming, no surprises to us because we've been talking about energy and metals being the worst sectors. And in general, I guess like the sell sectors that we've talked about are doing quite nicely. Agriculture, energy, metals, the ones that we hate, demand destruction. We believe the market's pricing some of that in now. And of course, the, the ones that are hot at the moment, communication, semis and technology, all doing better. If bio is going to go, that could be another one along with along with consumer discretionary that should theoretically be in its point in time now. Maybe we'll do bio in the next video, so stick around for that. RSP, this is the equal weighted S&P 500. What are we seeing together? Uh, nothing. <laughs> it's really boring. It's stuck in the middle Nothing coming out of this index. Good, though, to check it. TLT, treasuries, probably going to take a bit more brunt, I would say, before it goes good. And this is not really the best sign. Gapped up and a gap down. I think treasuries will go lower, possibly into the 100. But we saw what happened in 2011 with treasuries. Will that happen again? You've got to study it, make sure to pay attention to everything. We'll discuss it more in the future as we cover the debt ceiling issue. Let's move over to copper nothingness really 
finding some demand here, rallying a little bit. I wouldn't be surprised at all for it to go back up into the 3.82s, then possibly sell. Not much going on here. I still think copper is weak. Dollar. Now, I want US dollar to come down. That was a great weekly close. Let's take a look at that weekly close. Oh, it's a strong weekly close right through. So it's it looks like it wants to kind of do a bit of rally. And this was a huge closure for it right on the high. So it tells us that the big players were committed to that trade. So therefore, if we get dips in that trade afterwards, we should theoretically see buyers recommence. Now, I've said interesting bull zone on this yellow line here. I do think that is an interesting level. I've done a bit of work on it. I think that that is a zone that I will be focused in on. Uh, I would expect, well, I kind of expected maybe a little bit more follow through before selling off. We haven't seen that, but anything between, you know, these two kind of lines here, the yellow and the uh, white one, I'm looking for buyers to show some commitment. We'll check that out on the channel. I'm excited to bring that to you if it does occur. What about gold? Well, if dollar is going to weaken for a little bit here, which could be expected, gold may rally a small amount. Uh, I think something between 2025, 2028 is possible to see buyers commence to and then maybe a sell-off. I don't really, not really too interested in gold buys until we move down to the 1983 level. This is a super zone. We know how much trade's gone through there. That's what I would call equilibrium for gold right now. And the current price it's on is actually equilibrium for this zone. So it's a very heavy traded zone. A lot of buyers, a lot of sellers. We don't know which direction is going to win out yet, but I would be surprised if this occurs, that at least one of the chess styles that I'm thinking about this stage. Natural gas, pretty strong, not too bad at all. Coming into these highs, I uh, wouldn't be surprised for it to bust the high, then pull back, then maybe rally back up. Uh, yeah, natural gas is looking good. We've talked about how we thought this orange line was the base for natural gas. So far, so good. Proceed with caution. Rolls on these contracts are brutal. It's not called the widow maker for no reason. Let's move over to oil. Now, oil faces a bit of a short potential zone here where it is right now. I think if it makes maybe a low underneath, what is this? Uh, 70, probably 92, then there's a good chance that the market will actually continue to fall off. I am still negative on oil, but I don't mind a rally. Most traded zones, always a great level to be looking for reactions. Remember, we don't necessarily want to predict here. We're reacting to the market. So that's a switch potentially here. Uh, this would be an interesting zone as well. And then here, other than that, I don't see the signs of superior strength in oil just yet. I still think it's weak um, and I'd like to see it pressure more into the 65s at this stage. What about energy stocks? We saw Buffett actually sell some Chevron. He sold a decent portion of Chevron. I think it was down maybe 20% of the position. So interesting to see some clipping there in the big, big people's accounts. And yeah, I can see why. Look, demand destruction is not great for energy. And if you know your work on yields as well, you would know demand destruction is not uh, not fantastic, very correlated with energy. So I still remain pretty bearish here on energy. It's, it's at its first, I guess you would say TP level, uh, but I'm looking for it to breach underneath this red line. Once we get a close underneath there, we move towards 76. If we close below 76, we move into the 70s and 68s. And that would probably be the end of my bearishness on this particular pair, but it just doesn't like demand destruction. And you can see the turn. This was an excellent short. If you were a bear in markets, you know, we've talked about it. Copper into metals, into energy, usually uh, is a good kind of play there. Tesla. Oh, Tesla guys, um, guys and girls. Yeah, it's, it's tough out there on the Tesla trade. And I'll say why. I mean, the first thing was, of course, we, we did rally from these buy closes. We did rally like we thought. We didn't get 180. We didn't get 180. We got 177.29, which was like the expected move of the week last week, and then it sold straight off. Ah, look, I still maintain 145, 146 as being a level I want. I'm obviously, you know, this is more of a you know small couple multi-day trade. Bit frustrating it sold here. I can see why. I mean, obviously the high low 61.8 expected weekly options high, all of those things, but no gap fills. So if we have a look at the two hour, all of these gaps here, nothing was filled and not that wasn't filled either. So is it bullish or is it bearish? Very tough. I mean, the direction is still down. So you'd have to go overall, it's bearish, but I still think there's a chance that buyers commence into 
Tesla and we can still get towards the 180. Oh, it's tough. Maybe because we have a long leg doji, wait for it to go to above 170. And that could activate buyers to get back into that 180 territory. And then maybe something like this occurs. Uh, so we'll be looking for that. I still think that you'll get 145, 146 over the next couple of months though. It wouldn't surprise me. Four options into this week's options expiration. We know that 180 is fairly well struck, so I don't think it can get too far above there. Look at the calls, 180 calls, 51,000. Lots of people getting sucked into that one. Max Payne's at 170. This is the only week we pay attention to that. So yeah, 170, current price 166. Maybe that's an advantage of Tesla going up. And we know that 150 and 160 are small walls. Not huge, but the big strikes 180 this week. Let's move over to some other markets. Huge move here in in the uh, the old regional banks. I do think that was a warranted move. It is the right level, and I'm pretty happy with it. I could see further squeezing on the banks. I would say that if the best case scenario is probably something into the 41s, in my opinion, this is certainly a capitulation trade, not for the faint of heart. It is a risky trade. And it feels bad. And often the worst feeling trades sometimes are the best ones, the ones that everybody hates. I'm sure a lot of you are screaming at me going, this sucks, man. <laughs> I hate KRE. Why would you do this? It's purely because there's a lot of puts on it. And if you load up, you'll see that everyone was negative here. We squeezed them through. We got the pullback. And often you do get recovery. There could be more in KRE. Good start. 3% up. Find out what happens next. XLY, oh, it's so boring. Um, consumer discretionary struggling. Weekly still looks fantastic. Obviously, we want to see a breach here on the weekly and that to start pushing a lot of those stocks. So XLY is, is still got potential in it to be the next sector that's going to do better. We'll look at Amazon. It was up in the session, 0.85%, not too bad. Like to see it break through this line of 113. That should then open up 120 as a target and Amazon moves there, and if Amazon can get through there, then it could move to 135. So if you're feeling like you have to be a bull in markets, I don't really feel FOMO, so it doesn't really worry me, then this is one. And I think mostly the reason why we're potentially looking at it from a technical reason, break of the trend line, closure of the weekly, you know, that is significant, and uh, of course, we've been watching it. Let's have a look at Apple. Now, this is interesting. We've got earnings release, and we've got a market floating, the floating island. So because we have a floating island, what if we get a really bad sell day one of these weeks? Now, Wednesday and Thursday are actually 60% S&P 500 over a long period of time, bear days. So they're historically more bearish than other days of the year. Doesn't mean it's going to happen, but if you see signs, that could be interesting. So we've got a floating island here on the apples, and is it going to instigate some shorts? It's in our zone. I am not interested in Apple on the bull side whatsoever. I know there's no trend change. I understand. There's no switch of peaks and troughs, but no, not in this zone. No way for me. It's just not worth it. I mean, I think the funds would trim in here. I know I would if I was a fund. This is a trim zone for me with a nice, big, glorious profit. You would have to trim up a little bit. So yeah, and then wait for the next kind of thing. But we've got the island. We'll watch it. We'll continue to pay attention Google continues to be, you know, kind of one of those standouts. We know Ackman obviously got into it. Sneaky, sneaky. Uh, no surprises why he might do that. It was behind the others. Coming into a problem zone, though, for it, I'd say that at this stage, Google could still drive higher. Uh, I'm watching it above the reaction here. So that's certainly a zone I'll be looking for. And we'll keep updating, but can't see a bearish signal on it just yet. Two hour chart. You can see it started to float, but that doesn't mean it's going down. Volume remains relatively high after that big breakout. GDX, gold, is this a double top? Question mark. Well, we'll find out. Is it a demand zone? If you're a gold buyer, it could be an interesting zone for you. But if it breaches underneath, that's going to kind of solidify double top. And then we obviously know double tops can often start new trends towards the downside for a little bit and then float back up. Still bull on gold. Obviously, I just think we're in a trapped zone at this stage. IWM Russell, decent day for it, up 1.22 thanks to the banks. Big area that's coming up too. We'll use the US 2000 just to show. So this is obviously our uh, original short zone. We're still trapped. We don't have any signals yet either way. If you believe in long leg dojis and closes above, you would say the market is potentially driving here with, with Russell. 
I don't think so yet. I think we're stuck in a very interesting period of is this accumulation or is this distribution? And if we get breaches and closes underneath 1700, ooh, things could get nasty on the market. So Russell 2000, I'm paying a lot of attention. It's kind of like the real economy, Russell 3000, 2000. We want to be checking those out. Qs keep grinding higher. Historically, in pre-presidential cycle years, so pre-presidential voting cycle years, Qs do well in May and S&P 500 and Dow actually are down on the month statistically. So Qs continue to grind. Uh, we do know where we've kind of got our highs for this market. So if we go over here to the US 100, you can see we've got some red zones through this level and obviously some important zone in here towards where the bears could recommence. And that's it's going to be a very critical level. What happens up here is important. Can't see a sign of weakness in the queues just yet. Two hour doesn't open us for anything. And uh, yeah, since we got through that reaction level, we basically just had to let it grind higher. It's still very dull, hard to short the dull market. What about the S&P versus central bank liquidity? Boring, still in here, still divergence between the two. Still kind of points towards weakness coming in the medium term, but short term here, as I did the live stream, you know, I guess we nailed that one. Uh, this was the live stream from the previous session. So if you want to, you can watch the replay. We have it. We actually talked about it. I believed we'd probably go short in the start of the session due to some build that was there on a very small one minute time frame. Then I thought we'd come down to around this 61.8 level uh, in here. We ended up driving a little lower than that. And then I thought we'd see buyers. The buyers recommitted. They bought up here. I mean, the range just gets tighter and tighter. Let me show you here the daily closes. Look at this. What is this? It's just, uh, we're literally seeing daily closes here and daily closes here and everything in the wicks being held within this zone. So maybe we need to see a daily close actually close outside of this range. It's really hard to say anything other than that. We're basically just seeing buying in this zone and selling in this zone. Technically, it's not harder if you're an intraday trader and you recognize that pattern, but we're, we're just, we know this is the most heavily traded level. We know that the markets are just gravitating each way and there's nothing coming out of the last 24 hours to help us, to give us direction. I mean, maybe people think there is, but we are still stuck, stuck, stuck. So yeah, stuck until otherwise noted. Let's refresh the 19th, which is the OPEX. Obviously, we are about to see trillions of dollars expire as per this video. We know that the 19th has 400 puts on it. Massive. We also know 405 is the max pain. So we'll be watching that one very closely, 405, 405. And yeah, that's also a decent put strike. Lots of calls as well. I mean, Wall Street's done a great job. The 435, sad face for you. You're probably going to make no money, no money for you, no money for you, no money for you, no money for you. You get the point. Uh, yeah, they've got the lobster, I think, fairly intact this week. And I doubt the markets can really break out of these ranges by too much due to the fact that there's just too much money at stake. I mean, the Wall Street guys, the boffins have done well. On the live stream, we had to, we changed our kind of concepts here on Bitcoin a little bit. I did some VP work, obviously found this area plus the supply to be very shorty. And it's come back down now to an area where it has to find buyers. I think if you're really feeling short on Bitcoin, it's probably more like this, this, and then go short. Uh, that would be a very good one. There's also the heavy traded zone up here, which is, you know, short number two. The trade is probably more towards the short right now. Daily close never happened underneath our level. That's a shame because if that had happened, you would have got into your 24,000s, into your block, which we're looking for. And I still think that's very possible. We uh, Day rejection here, uh, obviously no new low under the alert zone, which we still remain as an alert zone. And at this stage, I'm kind of either looking for this, this, uh, and then maybe in here being kept cautious uh, or down, up, down, and this being the short. They're probably the two best chess plays I've got on this market at this stage. Let's move over. We know there's news coming out. Let's have a look. Core retail sales, Tuesday, May 16th. Here it is. And that's coming out at 8.30 a.m. Every FOMC person under the sun coming out to annoy us. Obviously, the government continues debt ceiling discussions and all those types of things. Then we scroll through. You can see the news is Fed Chair Papa Powell speaking. I don't know how many FOMC people there are this week, maybe 14. 
Look at them all. They're everywhere. I mean, I don't know what they're doing. They must be just coming out to reaffirm they're going to hold the rates. But yeah, interesting to see. There's so many of them. <laughs> it's like a like the plague of FOMC. But uh, anyway, they're coming out. And I would like to remind everyone that if you've enjoyed today's video, make sure to come sign up for three free trading cheat sheets. I finally got that data stuff together. So you will go on the track for getting that monthly newsletter with some helpful helpful information, I think. If you're interested as well, we're running a sale currently on our day trading masterclass. It ends very soon. So you might want to check that out. Highly uh, recommend, obviously had some great success with some students in the community. A few people have, you know, of course, given us some reviews on that. So you can check them out. And uh, if you're interested as well, follow us over on Twitter. Thanks so much, everybody. Watch uh, out for tomorrow's video. It should be a good one. And yeah, good luck in this market. Very trapped. Individual stocks are the way to go and have been probably for the last couple of weeks and sectors. And as we can say, there's a tale of two markets. If you've been a bear, energy and metals. If you've been a bull, well, I think it's clear top 10 stocks. And that's pretty much where it's been. Thanks so much. Catch you for now.